1949, the National Library of Lithuania in Vilnius acquired an early 17th century organ manuscript with a shelf mark from the former Jesuit college at Krajiai. Krajiai is a small town in the historic region called Samogitia, now in Lithuania. In 1618, when the manuscript was written, it was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and its name in Polish was Kroże. The Jesuit college was founded there just four years earlier, in 1614. Jesuits in Poland were strongly involved in establishing boarding schools for poor boys, and the schools specialized in teaching music, not only singing, but also playing on various instruments. It is likely that the organ manuscript was created in the process of such music instruction given to the boy or boys who were learning to play the organ. After 1949, the manuscript was left untouched until 1984, when the Lithuanian musicologist Jurata Trilupaitine saw it for the first time. She immediately recognized its importance as a source of hitherto unknown corpus of organ pieces by Adam of Vongrowiec and Vincenzo Bertoluzzi. Adam of Vongrowiec, a Cistercian monk who died in 1629, was known from archival sources as a famous organist, and Vincenzo Bertoluzzi served as organist to the Polish king Sigismund III Vasa until 1607. Then he moved to Sweden and died shortly thereafter. Trilupaitine announced her discovery in the Polish periodical Muzyka in 1993. Pieces of Adam von Growitz appeared in a Polish edition in 1999. This edition, printed in a microscopic number of copies, has long been out of print, and its impact was anyway very limited. The same can be said about a few Lithuanian publications with other selected compositions from the manuscript. It was only in 2017 when a facsimile edition of the whole source appeared in the series Fontes Musice in Polonia. It is also available online for free download. The aim of this lecture is to call attention to the true function and importance of the manuscript. I would like to argue that we are dealing with a manuscript manual of organ playing, a testimony of a regular course of counterpoint, composition, improvisation, basso continuo and diminution, complemented by exemplary compositions and basic information about the role of the organ in the Roman Catholic liturgy of the time. The book consists now of 103 folios, grouped in 12 gatherings of one kind of paper. The original foliation shows that at the beginning seven folios are missing. Six folios are missing also in gathering six, and at least one folio is missing at the end, that complemented an opening of which folio 103 verso is the left side. The watermark is hardly visible, and I haven't been able to identify it so far. The manuscript seems to have been written within a relatively short period of time. The date 1618 appears four times, and there is no other date recorded in the source. Staff notation is used throughout. Most of the examples and compositions that require two hands, including all pieces by Adam of von Grovitz, use the Italian intavolatura. A few contrapuntal compositions, mostly Ritterkars, including the two pieces by Bertoluzzi, are notated in open score. German letter tablature is used in isolated cases to clarify the pitches when corrections on staff made them ambiguous. A manuscript organ manual written in and for a concrete environment is a big rarity. Our knowledge of how keyboard playing was taught at the beginning of the 17th century is based almost solely on printed treatises that are directed for a wide target group. Printed material is always logically organized, but it does not reflect the needs of an individual student. 
The result of the organization of material into sections is also that the printed treatises rarely show a strong connection between seemingly detached areas of the art of keyboard playing. Precisely these aspects are clearly highlighted in the manuscript manual because it was created gradually in the real teaching process. At first sight, the sketchy appearance of our souls leaves an impression of uncontrolled chaos. Unfinished fragments scattered on pages make it difficult to establish what belongs together, and although verbal instruction is reduced to minimum, the inscriptions in Polish use terminology that has long been forgotten. On closer inspection, however, it becomes clear that the manuscript is in fact quite well organized. The first 30 preserved, preserved folios are devoted to didactic material with some exemplary compositions. The rest of the manuscript contains mainly complete compositions, many of them attributed with some additional didactic material. The first didactic part divides into three large sections, focused on the basics of counterpoint and basso continuo, imitation and diminution. We can only speculate what was written on the missing folios at the beginning of the manuscript. The first folio could have been a title page, and it is likely that some explanation of the notation and general rules of music followed. In any case, what appears on the first preserved folio belongs to the rudiments of counterpoint. Under the partly trimmed off title Concordancia, there are examples of contrapuntus simplex for two voices written on separate staves. Numbers between the staves indicate intervals. This abstract exercise is soon turned into embellishing the simple counterpoint with modest diminutions. The numbers are still kept for control at important points. Next examples, still for two voices, use fragments of chant as the base. Then one kind of bass movement is excerpted with various possibilities for counterpoint. Another example shows the skeleton of canonic progression with alternating intervals of a fifth and tenth. Then a complete Kyrie chant placed in the bass is set with a free voice in the soprano clef. All these examples confirm the importance of learning two-part counterpoint as a basis for composition and improvis improvisation at the keyboard, a fact well known from many printed treatises. At this point, first examples of basso continuo appear. They are harmonizations of cadential movements in the bass. We see first a downward movement ending with the clausula tenorizans, and then a movement from first degree to the fifth and back to the first. Interestingly, each hand is given two voices, and beautiful voice leading is evidently important. The examples pro accidents in basso generali are thus treated contrapuntally, not as straightforward sequences of chords. Back to two voices, three other examples follow. The last one stresses the bass movement in thirds and shows possibilities of syncopated counterpoint. This issue was already hinted at earlier. Now it appears in a more systematic way. Different possibilities of adding the second voice to such a bass are presented one above the other. After two other skeletons of interval progressions, one showing alternating fifths and octaves, comes the issue of adding a bass to a given tenor and inventing counterpoint for a bass ascending and descending by an octave. At the end of this section, there are shorter and longer bass progressions in semibreves with the inscription examples in counterpoint for a disciple to choose from. 
These exercises invite from, for improvising. They are, they are not realized and no space for a second voice is left on the page. Next opening is devoted to examples of basso continuo. They are extended cadential formulas. One of them, showing a standard, standard set of cadential suspensions, has seven bass notes placed on the circle of fifths. In this way, a sequence of cadences is introduced. What comes next is a substantial section devoted mainly to short imitative compositions. In the manuscript, they are called fantasias. Many of them have only a designation of the mode, for, for instance, octavitoni, but this designation is sometimes preceded with a letter F or a shortcut fun. On the first opening of this section, still another example of a counterpoint to the bass written in semi-briefs is followed by several imitative pieces. The first two are evidently constructed in two voices, but sometimes, when space between the two voices allows, a third voice is added for a short time, and the concluding cadence may be set in, in as many as four voices. These additions of a third voice are often written by another hand, a hand that is less skilled and may have belonged to the student. They may testify to learning by filling a basic skeleton of imitation, but they may have been also added at another time by a later user. The question of handwritings in the manuscript still awaits systematic research. An interesting link to the preceding section is the voice leaving in cadences taken from the previous isolated examples. The result is that even in the more lively fantasias, the final cadence is unornamented and moves in semi-briefs. Within this section, there are also examples, like the one we see, of fantasias written in three and four voices. However, their texture is never consistent. Sometimes the fourth voice appears for a short time to fill the harmony, or when the fourth voice enters with the subject, one other voice disappears. It becomes clear that this kind of polyphony is conceived at the keyboard, and the intervolatura notation is an ideal vehicle for its expression on paper. It would hardly be possible to write it down in open score, because the voices often merge or multiply, and occasionally a thick chord is used for better sound, like in, in Italian examples of early continual practice. Among the short fantasias, one more exercise of basic counterpoint appears. It is setting of the whole Veni Creato melody, first in the upper voice, then in the lower voice. The main scribe, the teacher, did not finish the second setting. Presumably, this task was taken over by a student, who unfortunately was not very successful. In 16 bars, or caselle, he wrote parallel octaves and fifths, used a clausula in the middle of the phrase and could not come out of it, and at the end he was completely confused with the clausula cantisans placed in the bass because he wrote another one syncopated in his soprano. Another interpolation is the example with extended cadential formulas in each mode. It might have been needed here because the fantasias require a basic knowledge of modes in order to shape the subjects and plan the cadences properly. More cadences follow after the fantasias. They are set in sequences, here also in shorter values and with some modest diminutions. Cadences of various kind and length seem to have had a fundamental significance. They are scattered throughout the manuscript, as if it was a kind of basic exercise that has to be repeated in many forms and really mastered. Almost the same can be said about counterpoint in two voices. Next two openings present examples of versets for Kyrie and for the sequence Mitit ad Virginem, with the Cantus Firmus in semi-briefs placed in the upper voice.
It is only after these additional examples where the first setting of the chant in three to four voices appears, another setting of Veni Creator. At the bottom of the page, there is another sequence of cadences and an example of basso continuo, a sequence of going five to six upwards and seven to six downwards. This example has a note saying that it is an important one. The third large section is devoted to diminution technique. It starts with several formulas of figuration that fits the slowly moving bass. An example in two voices shows how diminution patterns may be used for sequential dialogue between the voices. Then there are many examples of diminuting fragments of melody in various values, semibreeds, minims, and crotchets, as well as of cadential formulas. They are followed by diminutions placed in the bass that moves over the circle of fifths or descends by steps. Next, there are extended cadential formulas with diminutions in the bass or in the soprano, ending, not surprisingly, with a simple cadence in four voices. Then the important example of basso continuo with the sequence of 7 to 6 is utilized for diminutions placed either in the bass or in the soprano. Another remark written here says that this sequence is often used in basso continuo, and this very exercise may be used instead of in chapta in the first mode. We shall explore the concept of in chapter in a moment. This section concludes with examples of figuration placed above long notes in the bass, or chords played by the left hand. They are often set as sequences. The extensive use of sequences for practicing cadences or patterns of figurations obviously helps memorize them and accustom the hands to placing them in many positions on the keyboard. In the middle of the diminution section, there is an important interpolation with a mysterious Polish title Fingowanie Klawiszów. The word Fingowanie is not known in modern Polish. The examples are base formulas in Cantus Durus or Cantus Mollis, sometimes with numbers that indicate the modes. Through reading the many Polish inscriptions that accompany the bass lines, it becomes clear that this is an instruction of transposition through the change of clefs. And indeed, the basses are either repeated in a different clef, or a different clef appears next to the original one, or at the end of the line. At the end of this large opening part of the manuscript, the learning process is focused on bass lines, presented with occasional figuring. The bass lines were intended as exercises in transposition. There is a double clef at the beginning of the first bass line, and in basso continuo. But, as we have seen, basso continuo in this manuscript is not a practice of playing simple chords. In other words, it is not seen in opposition to the counterpoint, but rather as another facet of it. The exercises in basso continuo are always realized contrapuntally and may serve as a basis for elaborating the skeleton with diminutions. In these long bass lines, many bass movements from previous shorter examples are incorporated, including sequences and various kinds of cadences. More of them appear realized on the side. In fact, Realization of the basis should combine counterpoint skills, ability of identifying sequences and cadences, and diminution, almost all areas covered so far. And the last opening presents another set of bases in different modes with an inscription, this is in chapter. The word in chapter is not otherwise known as a designation of genre except for one occurrence in another organ manuscript from the Duchy of Lithuania, 
dated 1626, the so-called Sapieha album. There we encounter it as Incepta Procurie Magne Deus, a short piece in large note values that is little more than an extended cadence. In principle, it does not differ from a Perambulum Nakirie from the same source. So we may infer that Incepta, used, it seems, as a singular form, is an opening verset, a kind of perambulum. In our manuscript, there is another set of incepte in eight tones on folios 63 to 66, fully realized, that has the same characteristics. They look like simple realization of a continual line, and the voice leading is often, but not always, blurred by additional voices that fill the texture. It may be no coincidence that the bass lines for improvising in chapter are followed by a set of intonation termination formulas for psalms and magnificat in different modes. We have seen that in chapter may open a, sets, a set of versets for Kyrie, but the proximity of information on the Vesper liturgy may suggest that an incepta could have been used at the beginning of psalms and magnificat that were sung alternating with the organ. At this point in the manuscript, six folios are missing. On the next page, there is a continuation of a richer car in open score, but its beginning is lost. The rest of the source is filled mainly with compositions that would have served as examples of contrapuntal pieces, either short and often lighter in character, that belong to the genre of fantasia, or longer and more serious called richer cars. Many of these compositions are attributed to Adam of von Grovitz, but it can't be excluded that he might have written also the majority of the unattributed pieces. I am not going to analyze the complete compositions, but in the context of the first didactic part of the manuscript, it is interesting to note that all Adam's works are written down in intavolatura, including his four richer cars. As is uh, the case with the shorter fantasias, also Adam's richer cars are based on one principal subject and tailored for the keyboard. Their inconsistent texture cannot be notated properly in open score. As opposed to them, richer cars by Bertolusi and all anonymous richer cars are written in open score and show a more learned approach to the genre. One of the Bertolusi's pieces, actually called Fantasia, but far removed from the short didactic examples um, of a point of imitation, presents two subjects simultaneously and transforms them into new shapes in the course of the composition. An anonymous ricercata quartitoni has separate sections devoted to two subjects that are combined, combined at the end. Another ricercata, in the same mode, has the famous subject La Sol Fare Mi and a related counter-subject Mi Fa La Sol. Astonishing is that there is absolutely no other material in this piece. One of the two anonymous richer cars at the end of the manuscript uses a bold subject with two chromatic steps, F to F sharp and G to G sharp. On the other hand, one of Adam's pieces with the inscription Pro Organo is notated on three stades, the lowest marked pedale, it is the only instance of an intavolatura on three staves known to me. The pedal part is quite advanced, and the composition is actually a kind of preambulum devoted to various ornamented sequences. We have already noticed, noticed the use of sequences as a didactic tool. Now it can be also seen as a tool for building and expanding a composition. And in this period, a composition means also an improvised composition. Precisely this device is shown close to the end of the book on two openings with a title Exempla do Fantasi, that means examples for fantasias. 
The examples are short sequences operating with close imitation of short motifs or ornamented cadences. Polish inscriptions between them say, continue until you reach this, and the next sequence follows. Anonymous examples of short compositions that make use of almost all elements taught in the manuscript are found on folios 50, uh, sorry, um, 85 verso to 91 recto. There we find thick caudal openings from the in chapter, diminutions over a held bass note or chord, long diminutions in the bass or soprano, sequences with short motifs, and unornamented final cadences. One of the slow openings has also an added ornamented version of the bass line. Another piece, Super Primum Tonum, has an alternative ending for modulating from De Sol Re to A La Mi. At the end of the first section of the manuscript, we noticed many bass lines, some intended for in chapter and chant formulas for sounds and magnificat. Among the compositions that dominate in the second section, we find another use of bass lines, this time constituting two almost complete sets of mass versets, Kyrie Maius, followed by Gloria and Sanctus, and Kyrie Ferialne, for weekdays, likewise followed by Gloria and Sanctus. There is no annus day in either Mass. There are precise indications as to what is sung by the priest, what is sung by the choir, and what is supposed to be played by the organist. These Mass percents, set as bass lines with some figures, resemble the procedure applied by Adriano Panchieri in L'Organo Suonarino, but the lines themselves are completely different. They show us, nevertheless, that building complete pieces on the basis of a bass line was considered an important skill that combined the knowledge of counterpoint and basso continuo, seen as two complementary ways of composing at the keyboard. Other liturgical music in the second part of the manuscript Include, includes three verses of Magnificat in the sixth tone. With a Polish inscription, it can be also primi toni, but one has to end on de la sol re. The two psalm formulas have the same intonatio, and actually the second and third verses use the formula of the first tone, even though they end on F, not on D. By changing the final cadence, one can also change the mode, a procedure already noted in one of the free compositions, and one that is prescribed also in another Magnificat on folios 98 to 99, this time in reverse. Magnificat pro primo tono et sexto, sextum in efa ut finire. It is possible that this simple device on ending a piece in almost whatever mode could also be applied to the pedal piece by Adam of Wągrowicz. Immediately after the final bar, there is a set of ending movements of the bass, with the title Pro Finali. The same title, Pro Finali, announces another set of extended cadences in all tones that look like the simple in chapter. These versets seem to have a function of an organ response to the intonation of Magnificat, so probably they replace the words anima mea domino. All the sung intonations are duly reproduced on the same opening, with written instructions from which a note one should begin playing and on which note one should end. As we have seen, the organ manuscript from Krajiai offers much more than just an important output of two composers, however significant it may be. It is a valuable source that gives us insight into a method of teaching the art of playing the organ in a remote corner of Europe. It is a witness of a real learning process, and at the same time it confirms 
that many elements of the Italian tradition, combined with the relatively new Basso Continuo approach, were already quite widespread before 1620. Noteworthy is that the Italian way of teaching is not based on any known Italian treatise. It is an individual approach of a master who was well-versed in the Italian style and could supply the student with his own quite idiosyncratic examples. This manuscript is longing for more serious research, and for sure it deserves a modern edition. <laughs>